Okay, well, thanks to the Institute for Work and Health for inviting me, and thanks to Ron, not only for inviting me, but also for sitting on the advisory board of the On The Move Partnership. Uh, he's been a great addition to the board, reminding us that we have to learn how to tweet and do <laughs> other things that uh, we weren't doing in order uh, to survive. So the presentation I'm gonna give today is actually co-authored with Catherine LaPel, who unfortunately, I think she's very happy not to be here, <laughs> uh, but uh, isn't here today. And also I decided to add a bit of uh, some preliminary stuff from the statistical component, and that's headed up by Michael Hahn, a Canada Research Chair at the University of New Brunswick, who is soon moving to uh, University of Western Ontario uh, to take up a CRC chair there that will continue some of this work. Uh, and so the paper, as Ron has pointed out, is called Employment Related Geographical Mobility and Occupational Health in Canada. And I'll tell you what ERGM is as we move forward. So just an overview of the presentation. Um, the purpose, from my point of view, of this presentation is to get researchers here interested in this issue uh, uh, for, for a bunch of reasons. So looking at the relationship between geographical mobility to, from, and within work and occupational health and safety. So I'm gonna introduce you to the partnership and the program of research that we're doing that's examining patterns of what we call ERGM in Canada across multiple sectors and regions. Health outcomes are not a focus of our research in this partnership, but there are several OHS researchers who are on the team and we are looking at policy and other issues related to OHS. One of the original goals, that's the Safety Net Center was the primary sponsor for the development of this partnership. It's a health and safety research center. This is not a health and safety research study. But one of our goals, and I could tell you about the history of how that evolved, but one of our goals in terms of coming out of this is to, we hope to have laid the foundations for a major national and ideal, ideally international study on this issue. After I introduce the partnership and the research gap that we're trying to fill, I'll give a quick overview of some OHS research on geographical mobility and offer some preliminary findings from two components, the policy component that Catherine heads up and the statistical component that Michael Hahn heads up. I'll emphasize the challenges associated with learning about the diverse populations, regional patterns and complexities of extended commuting from administrative data and the challenge, challenges that I think would be likely be even greater if we were trying to add health data uh, to our analysis. I'll also present insights from a major report on extended commuting and OHS policy that's under development by Catherine LaPel and David uh, Walters from Cardiff, who is actually a specialist in mobile workers or seafarers. OHS researchers coming from different disciplines bring to occupational health and safety research and practice a deep understanding of the way different types of motions and motion rhythms can affect the health of workers. The research of ergonomists, for example, has shown that immobility, holding our bodies in static postures, can cause static strain and contribute to injury risk. It has also shown that repetitive motions, awkward postures, and certain kinds of manual materials handling can contribute to cumulative trauma. Given the centrality of motions to the work of health and safety researchers, it shouldn't surprise, the, they wouldn't be surprised, I don't think, by the claims of mobility theorists that mobility is a pervasive aspect of human lives, including our working lives. But with some limited exceptions, particularly in the literature on international migrant workers, most OHS research, I think, tends to focus at the level of mobilities and motions within workplaces rather than on the relationship between OHS and journeys to, from, and within work. OHS researchers are also well aware that shift patterns and rosters need to be taken into account when assessing exposures and injury risk. They've shown that physical and psychosocial demands, both at work and away from work, influence the risk of injury and illness. They know that vibration and related bodily motions often associated with employment in mobile workplaces like ships, fishing vessels, and trucks are risk factors. And they played an important role in outlining the risk of work at home or telework and of international migrant work and precarious work more generally in terms of occupational health. 
but they've looked less at geographical mobilities like extended commuting and employment in transient and work mobile workplaces and their potential relevance for OHS monitoring, regulation, exposures, and preventions. They've also paid limited attention to ways motions or micro mobilities within workplaces and work scheduling might interact with larger spatial and temporal scale mobilities, including starting places, ending places, and the in-between uh, in terms of their influence on occupational health. So looking at these larger and diverse spatial and temporal scale mobilities across provinces, sectors, and populations in Canada is the focus of the On the Move Partnership. And we use the term employment-related geographical mobility to talk about that. So what is ERGM? In On the Move, we define it as geographical mobility to, from, and within employment. It includes the geographical temporal spectrum of mobility, ranging from working at home, through extended daily commuting, to prolonged absences in distant regions, provinces, and countries. Our focus in On the Move is on that part of this spectrum of ERGM that goes from extended daily commuting of up to three hours or more, right through to more prolonged absences in other provinces and countries by Canadian workers. And we also include in this spectrum, and this is one of the things I think that's unique to On the Move, international labor migration into Canada. So we're looking at that spectrum of extended daily interprovincial international commuting by Canadians, but we also are looking at temporary foreign workers coming into Canada. And we include attention to mobile workers, truckers and fishermen, for example, and workers employed in, in multiple and transient workplaces. An example there would be construction uh, or home care workers. So in our approach, ERGM includes the start and end points of mobility, as well as the journey in between, as with the commute to work. The rhythms or cycles associated with ERGM, like shift scheduling, and the ways the mobilities of some groups might influence or constrain the mobilities of others. For example, uh, if you have a partner who works in Alberta, uh, you know, does that constrain the mobility uh, in terms of work of the, the woman who's left behind essentially as a single parent? Um, and also the ways the mobilities of, uh, I'm sorry, and the ways mobility might be associated with immobility. And you can think of that in the case of living caregivers, temporary foreign workers who come into Canada who are then immobilized inside a particular workplace. But another example of that that we think needs to be looked at is work camp employees who in a sense are immobilized during the prolonged periods when they could be living in a work camp. It includes geographical or spatial mobility within work. So we're looking at tree planting. We're not looking at tree planting, but that would be an example of something that you could look at, uh, multiple workplaces and so on. So employment-related geographical mobility is, is extended, it's complex, and it's an increasingly pervasive feature of Canadian society. In Canada, as elsewhere, journeys to, from, and within work are often becoming more sustained and complex. Daily commuting within and between cities is widespread, and we know that Toronto, for example, has some of the longest, uh, the most prolonged commuting that's going on in, in, in Canada. Um, and we also have commuting from rural to urban and from urban to rural areas for the purpose of work, which is widespread in many parts of the world. Interprovincial ERGM is also common in Canada and it's associated with varying work cycles ranging from daily as from Gatineau to Ottawa, for example, but across a provincial boundary, which is quite interesting, to weekly and more prolonged up to several months absences from home residences and communities for one or more family members. And many Canadians work outside the country and growing numbers, well, until recently, growing numbers of temporary foreign workers uh, were being brought into Canada in both professional, highly skilled jobs, and lower skilled job uh, categories. We also have an increase in precarious employment. So from a mobility perspective, an increase in the number of people who are working in multiple workplaces and transient workplaces. We have an increase in mobile work with globalization and so on. I mean, you simply need to drive the 401 to see trucking, to see the phenomenon of trucking and just-in-time delivery and what that means in terms of the growth of employment in that particular sector. And the same is true of shipping. Alberta's oil and gas economy and expanding resource development in the north, in mining, hydro development, and oil and gas development 
have in the past decade, I think as many of us know, attracted tens of thousands of Canadian and foreign workers employed in multiple sectors, from construction through operations, transportation, and the service sector. And again, some of those would be workers leaving southern Ontario, where you've gone through essentially through a, a degree of deindustrialization uh, and now migrating to work elsewhere. So the On the Move partnership, essentially multiple grants and contributions from partners. So we have uh, a number of community partners, a seven-year program of research. We're actually in year three. That needs to be updated. Uh, 44 co-applicant co researchers, 17 disciplines, 22 universities, and Memorial is the lead. So this was developed out of the Safety Net Center. 36 partner organizations, and we're training and mentoring. We're, well, we're over 70 trainees in terms of what we anticipate to train. Diverse populations engage in different combinations of ERDM under very different circumstances. So you've got your Gold Watch professional executive employees who often engage in very extensive ERDM, but under very different conditions from other groups of workers who, if we take the opposite extreme, might journey alone or with their families to other countries and regions and be paced to pay, or forced to pay for and achieve their own transportation and their own accommodation in their work uh, community. So the engineer might work in transient workplaces, but their experience with ERGM and its potential consequences for OHS are likely different from those of home care workers who work in multiple homes and shift to new homes on a regular basis. So if we look at some of the research on OHS and, and ERGM, uh, a, a lot of it is focused in the area of migrant workers. So we've got uh, research on migrant workers in agriculture, construction, domestic work, and hotel work. Uh, again, a lot of those uh, would be focused on temporary foreign workers, but a lot of the people who work in those sectors are actually internal migrants. If you think of the, ho the hotel sector, for example, in places like Banff and so on, some of those are international migrants. Uh, some of them are Canadian migrants in terms of young people, and some of them uh, could be living in nearby communities and, uh, and commuting in. So you've got a mixed labor force, often stratified by citizenship status and, and race, uh, in the hotel sector. Uh, we've got research on, on uh, research that has looked at a, a whole range of OHS issues. So, I mean, in, in some ways, in terms of mobility, we've probably got the best research that's out there on OHS and related to mobility for this sector. Uh, and I think that if, if we look at, one, one of the interesting questions for me is basically, uh, what happens when you get these differently mobile groups inside of the same workplace or similar workplaces? And there's not much research that's looked at that. So what happens, for example, on the Quebec North Shore when you have 10% of your labor, process, uh, your labor force inside of seafood processing who are Mexican migrant workers and the other 90% who are local workers? How does that play itself out in the workplace? And we're really just starting to see some research that's starting to look at that. Sylvie Gravel gave a paper at CARWA uh, this week that is starting to look at those issues inside of Quebec. And the other paper that started to look at that is a, a new paper by uh, Carrie Probish and Gerard Otero on BC agricultural workers, where they compare systematically the OHS issues of temporary foreign workers and the issues of women who are part of immigrant families who have, are Canadian citizens uh, but who are uh, precarious workers inside of that sector. And we have seen recent reviews that have called for more research on migrant workers OHS. So there, if, if there's research out there, this is where it is and there's not enough of it. There is research also on commuting to work and accidents. A lot of this work has been done by transportation psychologists. Most of the focus there is on daily versus other kinds of commutes, okay? So people going back and forth, doing extended commutes in terms of time or distance. And the focus is really on the risk of accidents and stress while commuting, so the risk of car accidents. The, the focus is not so much on um, the way in which commuting might increase your risk of injury at work. Uh, because you arrive, you're very, you know, you could be highly fatigued and so on, but also the way in which we think commuting tends to drive shift schedules and interest in shift schedules. So if you have a long commute, you don't want to do it every day, right? It, it, particularly if you're paying for it. 
and particularly if it's using up three or four hours of your day. So we think there's an incentive there, basically, uh, if you are doing a long commute, to want to work fewer days with longer shifts, for example, or to, to do many, many days in a row uh, and then uh, have to commute less. Um, and there's, so there's not a lot of research out there on how work scheduling might encourage extended commuting. That's the other thing. So the employer wants uh, people, or they, the employer decides we want uh, to move to 12-hour shifts in six, six day weeks. So do then workers are going to get a few more days off, do they decide that they can commute? Uh, and there's examples from Australia of drive-in, drive-out uh, situations uh, where people started commuting 1,000 miles, basically driving 1,000 miles after having worked multiple days uh, because they could do it. They had enough days off to, to pull it off. And then research on micro-mobilities. Extended commutes don't need to entail long distances. And we heard this really uh, vi vividly from uh, Stephanie Premji's presentation, the first time I've heard her results on immigrant precarious workers in Toronto's daily commutes, uh, which is on the move funded research. And you know what she describes is extremely complex, extremely stressful, and extremely expensive, expensive from the point of view of their budget uh, commutes for these uh, immigrant workers and the consequences uh, for them and their level of fatigue when they got to work uh, from these commutes. And again, home care workers have very complex commuting patterns. Their initial commute might be relatively short or long, so they could be going interprovincially, they could be working in their city, uh, but they go to work and then it's a three hour shift and then they go home and then they go back to work and it's another three hour shift or they go to another workplace uh, and so on. So employment in transient workplaces uh, and w the kinds of complex commute and work patterns uh, that this might uh, create is, is one of the issues. And again, this is touched on in the literature. You think of Bosco's work on temp agencies, for example. But again, what we're trying to do is pull out uh, this mobility and think about what it means. And again, I've already talked about the issue of extended work shifts and long work hours. And the literature talks about this with live-in caregivers. It talks about it with migrant farm workers. It talks about it with work camp residents uh, in resource extraction in injuries. But we really need to know more about it. And what I haven't seen is a detailed description of those work schedules. So you'll see over and over, they tend to work long hours. They tend to work many days in a row. But again, where's the, the actual detail on those schedules and what it means? So the research gap that On the Move set out to address was the lack of systematically, historically informed comparative research in Canada or elsewhere that looks at the spectrum of ERGM in multiple regions, sectors, occupations, types of enterprises, and groups of workers that seeks to take into account the effects of policies on ERGM and its consequences, and that looks at its impacts on employers, workers and their families, including OH&S impacts, and home and host communities. And this is the research design for On the Move. So basically, uh, we've got four main streams of research over seven years, a policy research stream, a statistical research stream, and in the design they were front-ended to try, to try and get them going early on in the research. So the statistical research is trying to figure out what we can get from administrative data, and policy research is looking at uh, policies. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Most of our budget is here in field research, basically because of the limitations in the other data sources that are available. So we're doing a lot of our work is on the ground, talking to people, trying to figure out the dynamics of ERGM and its consequences. We're looking at apprentices and mobile youth, skilled trades and construction, transportation and shipping, resource extraction industries, the service sector, uh, and we're interested in so people entering into mobility but also people who exit. And of course, one of the reasons why you might exit would be if you were injured or you were killed would be the other, another possibility. So again, latent in this approach are, is some beginning thinking uh, about occupational health. And this is just, before I talk about the statistical component, I want to stress the difficulties with doing this research. So this is a map that was taken from a study that was done by, uh, by, the, by Northern Health in British Columbia. 
they were trying to figure out basically how many work camps they had in northern British Columbia. And they, they, it t they had to go to multiple agencies to try to get numbers on work camps because different organizations are responsible for different sectors. Uh, nobody actually had this information in one place. And they still don't know how many people they're talking about, but they found 1,800 industrial work sites in northern British Columbia. 98 proposed or current projects, 27 proposed new ones, and their data don't inclo include silviculture camps. So when people talk about, particularly about industrial camp workers, but again, I would suggest that this is an issue across mobile populations, they, they talk about them as shadow populations. And the, uh, in, in northern Alberta, the Wood Buffalo uh, municipality created its own census to try and figure out how many, you know, who, who was the shadow population of workers, where were they living. They came up with about 39,000. A research team working with uh, On the Move has suggested there's 60,000 work camp beds. Yes. Silviculture? Silviculture is tree planting. So it, it, again, it's just finding these populations. And again, this, these are just the work camps. So we've got this difference in the estimate that's come out. This doesn't include all the people who are living in trailer parks, hotels, uh, in the backs of their cars, and so on and so forth in these uh, contexts. So the statistical component is Michael Han and his team. Uh, when we designed this study, the only major administrative data set we could find that had place of work and place of residence was the census, basically. So we start, oops, sorry. So we started off, well, we're going to focus on the census uh, to, 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 to look at this and, and try to document hot spots for extended commuting, also look at the temporary foreign worker database. But since then, some new databases have started to, to, to be worked with. One is at Stats Canada. It's a longitudinal tax filer data set that will actually allow and make it possible to track the careers of mobile workers over time. But this data set has place of residence and province of work. It doesn't have place of work. So it's very, very vague in terms of where they're ending up. ESDC is developing databases that include EI data that also have potential, and Michael is working with them. Nobody has looked at health data, the possibility of finding health data that could be uh, used in this uh, and linked to some of these other data sets. So this is uh, just an example of what we could get from the census of 2006. By excess commuting, we mean people who are commuting more than 200 kilometers, basically. Uh, we don't know how often they are. This is as the crow flies. We don't know how long it takes them. We don't know. And we don't know because the census only talks about up to 200 kilometers, and after that, it, we don't have any data. We don't know if they're going 2,000 kilometers or two, 201 kilometers. But it does show you that there are, sorry, that there are regions here in Canada where you have, you know, concentrations of, of people who are commuting uh, very long distances. But again, is distance, distance is an issue, but it's only one issue. Time is a huge issue. And I think for most of us, time is in many cases the thing that matters. So the, the census has place of work and place of residence, except for 10% of respondents in the working age population who list no fixed workplace. And of course, many of those are likely to be our mobile workers. They're likely to be, and they are in fact, we did look at this in a preliminary way. They tend to be male, they tend to be lower income, uh, and so on. Of course, your temp agency workers would be turning up here and so on. For them, we have no data. Uh, we don't know where they work because once you say no fixed workplace, you don't get any more information about their mobility. Again, it's distance as the crow flies, and it seriously underestimates the scale of mobility related to work and its complexity. Uh, you basically, it's where were you working the, you know, the week before the census, if it's seasonal work and you didn't happen to be working, uh, and so on, there's no data. Uh, but it does let us look at the demographic characteristics of differently mobile people, and we have a paper uh, that's just coming out now uh, that, that does a preliminary, takes a preliminary look at that. The policy component lead is Catherine LaPel, uh, and they're looking at policy drivers, so things in policy that would encourage employment-related mobility 
and might inhibit it. But, you know, the big thing everybody thinks inhibits it is, is employment insurance. Uh, and policy mismatches. So unanticipated effects that employment-related geographical mobility might have uh, that would reduce its effectiveness. So to what extent do our policies assume that we get up in the morning and we go down the road in our community, go to work, and come home at night? You know, across a range of policy frameworks, if we don't do that, if we're engaged in this kind of complex mobility, what kinds of gaps are going to open up in the policy frameworks? And they're looking at occupational health and safety policy, workers' compensation policy, employment insurance, labor standards, collective bargaining, health insurance and interprovincial agreements, temporary foreign workers' policy, uh, and pensions and social security. And those reports, the preliminary reports, are in various stages of completion. But we hope to have most of them out, uh, I would say, by uh, May or June of next year. OHS is one of the ones that's the furthest along. And they're looking at multiple jurisdictions because health and safety is a provincial responsibility, workers' compensation is a provincial responsibility. We're working in seven jurisdictions. Uh, so they're looking at federal law and provincial law in Newfoundland and Labrador, Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, Quebec, Ontario, Alberta, and BC, and also uh, at international law. And the methods for the OHS policy report, what Catherine did, and again, I know Ron was there, she brought together a bunch of key informants, basically, people who would have, through their work experience, potentially had to deal with the issue of mobile workers. Uh, and we had a, a lengthy discussion with them about what some of the key issues might be. Uh, they've done a review of the literature. They've done a classic legal analysis of the key issues that are identified in law. Uh, and they will be doing key informant interviews. So these are some of the preliminary results uh, that are coming out of that research. What they've done is they've organized their analysis in terms of OHS effectiveness, uh, when in terms of the policy effectiveness, in terms of dealing with issues that might arise getting to work, dealing with issues that might arise in the course of being at work, dealing with issues while living at work, so accommodations issues, and living at home while at work, which means basically when you take your family with you, uh, which many of these mobile workers do. So getting to and from work, um, road travel obviously comes up as an issue. There are issues with vehicle safety, driver safety, road conditions, road safety, uh, and, you know, and again, so the question really here is whose responsibility is it under law? And is there, you know, it, it, Kath, the point that Catherine makes is historically, let's say in the north, companies went in, government went in, they built single industry towns, they created houses, people moved there, they lived adjacent to their work and so on. We have fly in, fly out operations now, that's the standard approach. Turnkey mines, they don't want to invest in accommodations and housing and they don't want to build communities. Uh, is, is there a mechanism here of offloading risk? Whose risk, who's assuming the risk here when we move to a more mobile, transient, temporary type of employment situation? There are potential risks. Again, who's responsible if the vehicle that is taking you from the plane to the work site is badly maintained? If it's on a public road, if it's on a private road, if you're on the company road. Uh, who is, you know, and the example that was raised in the, uh, the focus group was you fly in, you get picked up by somebody who's driving a Jeep without any doors, it's minus, minus 20 degrees, this is a real case, uh, and they're going to drive you for three hours to a work camp. Now, you've just flown in, the company paid for you to fly in, or you paid for you to fly in, do you refuse? Do you exercise your right to refuse what is clearly a dangerous situation uh, and risk losing a three-week source of income? Uh, and then who, who pays for you to go home, or do you, in fact, accept that ride and go to the camp? Um, again, who's responsible for uh, road conditions uh, and so on? And then there are other means of transportation, helicopter, air travel. And again, you, you start thinking about, so if it's your responsibility to get yourself to and from work, even if, the, even if let's say, the company is paying for your transit, and they don't always, uh, what happens if you miss a flight? Right. So who's, you know, are you, are you going to get fired? Let's say the, the plane, the flight is canceled and you're, you're late getting to your shift. Or you can't get out. Then what happens? Do you, you, so you can't go home. 
does the company pay for you to wait that week or two weeks that you would have gone home while you're in a camp, or do you pay? Uh, do you have to go and find a hotel, basically, because somebody else is in your bed? Um, and so again, how do we exercise our right to refuse in that kind of context? Um, you know, are, are, we, is there, are we encouraged to engage in risk taking and is there a strong incentive to take risks because of economic incentives? Uh, at work, uh, and again, we've already talked about this. Ex extended commuting tends to be associated with extended uh, shifts. Uh, workers have an incentive to go in that direction because they're away from their families. What are you gonna do if you're not working? You want to be making as much money as you can while you're away from home. And then again, that could be extended daily commuting, a preference for 12-hour shifts, but certainly is true of work camps. Uh, so you want to work all the time. The employer would like you to work all the time, in part because somebody is paying for accommodation and travel and so on. So there's a very, very strong incentive here to work multiple shifts. And then we get into some of the consequences of that. I'll just give you an example. The last time, I have an airplane diary thing that I do now when I fly around because of this project. Last time I'd come back and I, it was uh, one o'clock in the morning, there was a worker standing beside me who just spontaneously started to talk to me. And he said, you know, I just got off a 12 hour shift in Yellowknife. I had been working six, day, six weeks straight, no, eight weeks straight. Uh, I got on a plane at five o'clock in the morning uh, I'm home now, and it's now midnight. My father's picking me up, and he's going to drive me to the community where I live, which is two hours away. I have a, a one-year-old child. I will have to leave again and go back in less than two weeks. Uh, and that's the good news, because in the winter, when I go in January, my contract says I can't leave until uh, the, it either thaws or the job is finished. And so last winter, I worked 82 days straight. And uh, that my contract did not allow me uh, to go home. I had to stay, and if I'd gone home, I would have lost my job. So that, you know, that's an extreme case, but it's not that extreme. I mean, you have the skilled trade workers who can fly in and fly out two weeks in, two weeks out. They like that. If the company tries to change it, they find another job in an afternoon. Uh, but not many, many workers are not in that situation. Uh, living at work, employer-provided housing, and again, that what Kath Catherine is finding here is there's very, very little in the regulations around housing uh, in terms of requirements. If the employer is providing housing, housing standards, and if there's anything in the legislation, it's really around environmental issues and public health issues, it's not thought of as an occupational health and safety issue. In some cases, of course, workers are themselves providing housing, and, you know, uh, Fort McMurray is very... You know, if you go into the community, one of the things you see is what they call it the biggest trailer park in Canada, right, where people are living in insulated trailers 365 days a year, and you could have five, six, seven people living in those uh, trailers. Uh, you know, and so, and we've got multiple jurisdictions within promises, but we have very weak, and this comes out in the northern BC study on industrial camps, we have very weak uh, regulation around accommodations. Uh, and again, if the housing isn't provided by the employer, but there is an expectation and an understanding that you're going to be available for work and you're going to get there and so on and so forth, uh, is that an OHS issue? Or, or is, and certainly there could be real consequences for your, your work experience. Again, fatigue, there are a whole bunch of issues that could come up here. And then living at home while at work, you know, uh, family-friendly work camps, very little out there in terms of any kind of policy or language around family-friendly work camps. Uh, the example Catherine uses is in Quebec, there's an ancient rule that says if there's a woman in a camp with a child, they ha she has to have a window in her room. And she thinks this is a legacy of cooks, basically. So the woman would have been a cook, she might have had a child. But I mean, that's, that's the kind of, that speaks to the neglect really around these kinds of questions. Uh, and she points out that in the case of Montreal, for example, there are truckers whose whole families live in the trucks. Right, and of course we know this in the case of migrant farm workers in the United States and so on, where often they bring their families with them. And I've certainly seen it with migrant uh, seafood processing workers in Newfoundland who've gone to New Brunswick and places like that, who would take their families and again, might be living in a trailer. You've got school issues, housing issues, a range of issues. If you leave your family at home, what about access to and the capacity to communicate uh, with them? And again, to modulate your life in a way that might work 
with their needs. Uh, somebody gets sick, somebody dies. And, you know, we've seen the, the uh, films on temporary foreign workers who, you know, where they're being asked by the recruitment agency in the Philippines, if somebody dies, what will you do? And the correct answer is nothing, I will not come home, right? But again, how does this play itself out in terms of internal migrants? So Kevin says, and I think she's right, there's a kind of paradox here. In terms of internal employment-related geographical mobility, we ha it's, it's essentially invisible to occupational health and safety policymakers. There's very little out there that is really designed to systematically address this issue. The data sets, you know, where are the data sets that would allow us to actually look at the relationship between uh, ARGM and uh, occupational health and safety, injury, illness, and so on, and there's very little regulation. The converse is temporary foreign workers who are highly visible to policymakers, but not necessarily to OHS policymakers, although uh, the current government has argued, I think they're going to move in the direction of taking away the right to immigrate of, t of living caregivers uh, because the argument is that that allows employers to abuse them because they can offer them the possibility of migrating. It's a very strange backward step given it's one of the few pro programs where they actually have that right. So no, the workers themselves are highly visible to policymakers, particularly at present. They're highly regulated in terms of what they can do and where they can go and who they can work with, uh, but not necessarily in their best interests, and we know that from the literature. Um, but the, and their challenges are different from those of other mobile workers, but there are some similarities here, and the solutions for them are, are probably different. So, you know, I, I had this slide, and I think, you know, there is a real risk of regulatory failure from the point of view of occupational health and safety here. And the lack of data, the invisibility is one of the problems. Yeah, I'm just finishing. Um, and Sergeant and Tucker recently wrote this paper on layers of vulnerability for international migrant workers. Uh, and they basically say they're, they're, if we can look at those layers of vulnerability by looking at their migration status, their conditions of recruitment, and the characteristics of international migrant workers. And my question is really, how might a similar analysis be applied to internal migrants? Because I think there's a lot we can learn from the literature on international migrant workers that in terms of our thinking about the relationship between mobility and OHS, there are, there are important insights there, um, but also from the work on precarious work and so on. So, you know, we know, for example, in the case of international migrant workers, language and cultural differences can have an impact on OHS. But think about your unilingual Quebecois worker who is working in northern Canada. To what extent are there facilities, opportunities, uh, support systems there that work for them in their language? And, of course, there are many Canadians who are immigrant workers. Again, if you go into Fort McMurray, what you see are large numbers of immigrant workers, some of who live in Toronto, who are driving, taxing, and doing a whole range of things in the north in order to get experienced jobs, income. What is the knowledge of, say, interprovincially migrant or mobile workers about their uh, rights, responsibilities, risks. And again, the, the thing about, and again, they don't have to be interprovincially mobile. This comes out in Kathy's work on, on, on home care workers, who basically, when she asked them, what do you know about the workplace that you're going into, many of them said, I know the name and the address. I don't know anything about the work environment uh, that I'm going into. And they're working in the same city. Uh, access to qualified health professionals is an is issue for international migrants. It could also potentially be an issue uh, for internal migrants. Again, one, because they may or may not be there, and of course places like Fort McMurray are overloaded. The healthcare system is overloaded because of the so-called shadow population. Uh, but also because, you know, you, you want to work all the time. Right, and you're in a remote location, or you know, again, you don't have the money uh, to access a healthcare professional. You don't know you have the right uh, or the insurance rights inside of that province, right? So you may keep your family doctor in Newfoundland. Uh, and then uh, all of the issues that we know from, say, migrant farm workers' research on how we might develop and deploy effective prevention intervention strategies in a, in a mobile population. So I've got some questions for you. Do we need a major national research initiative on employment-related geographical mobility and occupational health? 
given its pervasiveness, its complexity, and its invisibility, how might it be affecting our analyses of incidents, the effectiveness of regulatory regimes, of compensation and return to work? In other words, is there, are there gaps? Are there real problems in some of the work that we're doing because we're not paying enough attention to ERGM? In just in terms of, say, compensation data, and again, this is something that Catherine is getting into. If you work in one province and live in another, how does compensation work? Okay. You know, what, what are we picking up in our compensation data? If you live in southern Ontario and you work in northern Ontario, what does that mean? What does it mean in terms of underreporting? What does it mean? Uh, well, so if we're not paying attention to mobility, is there a problem with the work that we're doing? Gender, age, immigrant status, there are a whole bunch of issues here that could be explored, I think, in a lot more depth. So, and, and if we do need this initiative, and that's my question for you, what would it look like and who would do it? I think we need it. I think somebody needs to do it, and I'm not going to do it. <laughs> so I'm going to leave that up. Thanks. <laughs>